Hello there and welcome to the Blogger's Guide to Cruising. I'm Julie Peasgood and today I'm joined by a journalist, photographer and now turned expert blogger who has travelled to more than 80 countries across the globe. I'm delighted he's here to tell us all about his adventures. James Ellis, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, what ignited this passion initially for travel writing? Oh, well, I've got to blame my mum really, Julie. Uh, back in 1978, mum and dad got divorced we lived in South Yorkshire, uh -huh. owned a pub, and mum used her share of the profits to buy a car and caravan, packed me at eight years old, my sister at ten, into the car and caravan and decided to drive to Greece because she wanted to live in Greece. So she was like Shirley Valentine? She was a free Shirley Valentine, <gasps> exactly. Yeah. What a mum! Yeah. You, in the car, you... Mum, a 19-year-old female cousin, so the four of us, my sister, ten years old, Wow. Drove down to Greece. What an adventure. Yeah, mum had lived there. Uh, she'd been there, sorry, on holiday in a, past, uh, a few years previously and thought she'd lived there in a past life. So she decided it was time to go back. And that's what we did, yeah. And we ended up, we lived on a campsite for two years in the caravan until we got an apartment. My sister and I went to a Greek school when we could speak English and not Greek. And then to an English school, an international English school, when we could speak Greek. So it was all a little bit topsy-turvy, but it was quite fascinating wow. upbringing. Yeah. And when did you return to the UK? So I returned the first time to go to university in 1988, so that would have been uh, 10 years later. OK. I did a, four years at university and I went back to Greece for a couple of years and then came back to England in 1996. Gosh, and so you started writing literally about your travels and your experiences? I don't think it actually clicked with me then how much, what kind of wonderlust I'd inherited from mum. It yeah. just seemed as though traveling was part of what we what we did and naturally when we went to greece a lot of the traveling that we did was around the greek islands two thousand islands to explore what an amazing country to, to be in so in my teens my holidays were very much about myself and pals just going to the port of piraeus jumping on a ferry boat seeing which islands we'd end up at doing a bit of island hopping you know very much that sort of like laid back 1980s vibe wow you know sleeping on beaches or in tents and that kind of things and that's kind of where it all came from when i came back to england and i started writing because i actually studied as a photographer originally i started writing and i did news at first and i did some features work some health journalism and things like that. And I started working at Metro, the, the daily free newspaper. You were there for a, a nearly a decade. I was there for 10 years, yeah. Editor. So I started off there in 99, just when, when the paper launched. And a few months later, there was an Australian chap who was running the travel section, which was quite small at the time. And he decided to go back to Australia. And it was one of those kind of things, almost like serendipitous, where I just went into the editor's office and knocked on his door and said, can I have the travel editor's job? And surprisingly, he said yes. And Ten years later, there I was. We would expand the section massively. We'd done offshoot books with rough guides. I'd travelled to all these amazing countries and done some fantastic things. Uh, yeah, and that's where it all stemmed from. Yeah, 80 countries or over 80 countries. Because yeah. I've travelled extensively, but I don't think it's 80 countries. When did you start counting? Because I wish I'd started counting ages ago. I think it's when I stopped counting. It's <laughs> <laughs> really important. Um, it depends. I, so... I think there was some point in my head when somebody said to me, how many countries have you travelled to? Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking, I thought, can I count England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as four different ones? <laughs> and I think at first Cheat. I did. Cheating a little <laughs> bit, yes, yeah. Um, and I, I, I think I'd probably have got to more, but I had a, a, a bit of a fascination in the mid-2000s where I wanted to become the first British journalist to go to all 50 states in America. So I, I set about to try and do that. I failed massively. I got up to about 25 states or something. That's not bad. But, um, but I did spend a lot of time, obviously, on transatlantic flights, going yes. to, to and forward, and ending up in places like Wiskoki, nowhere that nobody's <laughs> ever heard about or really cares about reading about either. But I just wanted to get there and say that I'd done it. Yeah, to your wish list. Okay. Yeah. Wish list, or well, let, let's go, let's move on now to, to cruises. Sure. First cruise experience, how did you get into cruises? So, my first cruise experience actually came when I'd studied photography at university and, and mm -hmm. like I said, I went back to Greece for, for a while. And I was working for a newspaper in Greece as a photographer and somebody phoned me up, a friend of my mum's who worked for a cruise company out there. They'd been asked to do an incentive trip for a well-known American spirits company on a ship called the Sea Goddess One, which is now called Sea Dream One. Oh, it's a very Sea Dream, yeah. Yeah, very small luxury ship. I think it takes about 110 passengers or mm. something like that. So I was asked to go along and do photos of this incentive cruise. 
and it was a real um, different experience for me because I was about 22, 23 years old at the time. My previous experience in travel had mainly been things like backpacking and traveling on, on ferries and things like that. And to suddenly go from that to a luxury cruise ship was just a totally different experience altogether and really opened my eyes to a different side of, of travel, which, w which was luxury stuff, which I'd never done before. Yeah. And it was, there's quite an interesting story actually. It was the first time, that trip turned me from being a well done steak eater to eating my steaks rare. Because I sat down for dinner one night and ordered steak tartare. I had no idea it was uncooked and it <sighs> arrived but I was so um, embarrassed by the fact that I didn't know it was uncooked that I just ate it. And the first couple of mouthfuls, I was like, I'm not sure about this. Then by mouthful three, I was like, actually, this is actually quite good. <laughs> if um, it's good stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, so, it was, yeah, so that, that was another eye opener. Wow, but you were very young, 22, 23. Yeah. I remember taking my daughter on her first cruise when she was 25 and her attitude initially was, mom, I'm not nearly old enough to go on a cruise. I mean, there are lots of misconceptions around cruising. I think I believe there's a cruise for everybody out there but did you think that did you think cruising that's for when I'm 50 60 at the time I don't think I, I, I think I I was very much of that mindset like your daughter I'm here to do a job I'm enjoying it it's very different to what I'm used to but it probably wasn't for me at the time I still had that real sort of like independent spirit mm. of going out and discovering things on my own and one of the things that I found about cruising at the time was it seemed quite prescriptive in that you know you're going to be at a certain port at a certain day at a certain yeah. time and therefore I think um, it probably didn't grab me initially I appreciated what it was but I thought it was for a certain category of people and but I, I now agree with you I think absolutely there is a cruise for for mm. every everyone mm. and a lot of my cruising experience has been doing launch cruises these kind of things where a new ship comes into Southampton or Portsmouth or Dover and you go up and down the channel a couple of times on a one night thing there's loads of celebrities on board loads of travel agents loads of journalists and it's a very short snapshot of what cruising can be to it's people it's not proper really but it's not it's it? not proper cruising. it's great to see the new ships of course yes. to be at the naming ceremony yeah, and things yeah. like that and all that kind of stuff. So a great amount of fun um, you normally leave the next day with a very heavy head I have to say <laughs> um, but I think it was maybe a year or so ago when my wife and I took our twin daughters on a cruise ship that I had my real cruise epiphany when I did realise that cruising was something for, for, for everyone. Tell me, tell me more about that, because my daughter, incidentally, after that initial reaction, um, she, she's a complete aficionado. She loves cruises, and I think, I think she actually quite likes the prescriptive element, mm. oddly enough. It makes her feel very safe. It certainly works when, you, when you've got children mm. on, on those larger yeah, ships that are very, very well organised. So we'd been there, for, we, we took the cruise and it was our first cruise as a family. The, the girls were four at the time. They're, they're very active, very chatty, they like to do lots of stuff. And because we're both working parents, we often find it quite hard to spend time with, with the girls, quality time. So we decided that for seven days, we're on a Pianos Ventura on a Mediterranean cruise around Italy. We were going to drop laptops, drop phones, we'd spend every waking minute that we could with the girls. And of course, that's great in theory, but by seven, eight o'clock at night, five-year-old kids, four-year-old kids, they want to go to sleep. They don't want to stay awake <laughs> all night. So I think it was night, the, the second or third night, there was a black tie dinner and we'd booked into Marco Pierre White's restaurant. Oh, fantastic. What an amazing experience, right? Yeah. So we turn up with the girls, they're in their little cocktail dresses. I'm in my suit, my wife looks amazing. And we turn up, and there are a lot of people in there who've gone for a relatively quiet night without the kids. So Oops. we turn up within three seconds. Grace has knocked a baby Bellini over the table. <laughs> Martha's dropped some, dropped some water over the table. My wife's gone to try and pick things up. The salt's gone over the table. So we're swimming in water and liquid on this table. And my wife just said, kids club. Really? And we had one course with the girls. And we took the, we, my wife dashed downstairs, got them changed the pajamas. And we went upstairs to the kids club. The girls absolutely loved it. Because what they could do was sit around in the pyjamas with their newfound friends, watch a movie, fall asleep on beanbags. The Have guy, a burger rather yeah, than... Yeah. I mean, I the, love yeah. Marco Pierre White, but the kids might yeah. not. The guys were, were great who ran the kids' club. They'd look after them every night. They'd move them into beds if we wanted to. 12 o'clock, we'd go up, we'd pick them up, carry them back to the cabin. And it really set the tone for the 
for the whole trip then because we could have fantastic days with the girls yeah. where we do all those great things that cruisers get offer you, shore excursions and that kind of thing. But in the evening, Laura and I could also enjoy it for what it was, which was we had childcare on tap and the chance for us to go out, have great meals. And be with each other. Be with each other. It's feeling safe. Yeah, fantastic. It, was, it, was, it really was. And we came back singing, cruising uh, praises. We were both absolute converts to the cause. Isn't that fantastic? So are you going to be doing that more as a family holiday? I think, think we will, yes. Yeah. So, I, I say unfortunately, but it's not really unfortunate because I, I love them to do it. The girls have got their eyes set on a frozen cruise with <laughs> Disney. They want to go up. You've to the frozen north. And I'd love to do it, I have to say. I'm You've more, got to do yeah, it. I'm more of a warm weather kind of person. <laughs> That's why I've never been, I've never really done skiing. I like beaches, I like the hot weather and stuff like that. But if they want to go up and see fjords and all that kind of stuff, absolutely. They've got to. Put your budgie smugglers aside and <laughs> yeah. take them up the fields. Stay with me, James. And uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this quick break. <laughs> Welcome back to the Blogger's Guide to Cruising and James Ellis is still with me. James, in the last few years, cruising has m sort of mushroomed and become so much more popular. Mm. Why do you think this is the case? I think it's mainly because of the amount of cruises that are actually on offer these days and the kind of ships that you can go on. You can go on everything from tiny luxury ships that can get into really tiny ports, places that other ships can't get to. Mm. And then you can go on these huge ships with sort of like five, six thousand people aboard, which are pretty much floating cities at sea. I think if I look back to my own experience of cruising, when I first started writing as a travel writer, my opinion was probably that I didn't want to cruise because I felt that cities came alive at night and cruise ships tend to sail through the night and then during the day you get to go and do your shore excursions sure. and things like that. And one of the things I think that's happening more and more is that a lot of cruise, cruise companies are now offering overnight stays in, in ports. Yeah. So people can either choose to go out and experience that nightlife in a fantastic city, maybe mm. like Venice or Florence or Rome or somewhere like or that. Monte Carlo or Monte Carlo. Or Monte Carlo, absolutely. Ibiza yeah. even, yeah. And then have a fantastic time out get the tender back to the ship or mm. get back onto the ship in the evening and then they stay there the next day and then we'll sail again the, the next night. So I think those extended stays have really helped um, in, increase the, mm. the appeal of cruising to a wider audience. I also think this idea as well, you know, I think cruising has been unfairly characterised as being the domain of older people and absolutely there are cruise ships that, that cater towards that, that market. But there's just so much more than that these days. This idea that it's just full of silly people who ask questions like, what time does the 24 hour <laughs> buffet open and things like that. I think that's very much a thing of the past now. Yeah. You know, you're looking at things like huge water slides, yes. surf parks, yes. casinos, Cycle rides dancing. Above the ship. Yeah, an incredible, an incredible yeah. amount of things to do. And I think the ports are also getting more, more interesting as well. Mm. There's more on offer, there's more to do. And it's clearly a massively, massively growing market. Definitely. River cruising as well. My first ex first experience of seeing cities and towns in the evening was on a river cruise, mm. actually. And it is different. You know, I, I think some cities are entirely different in their character at night, you know, than they are in the day. Absolutely. I, so when I was on Ventura uh, last year, we stopped in Venice and we did an overnight in Venice. And the lovely thing about it, I think, was that at four o'clock, all the cruise ships left apart from ours which meant that the streets that previously had been teeming oh. were now the domain of locals and a few of us who were lucky enough to be staying overnight. Wow. So it was a totally different experience to what it had been in the daytime. Amazing during the daytime to be there and, and see it really bustling and things like that, but very, very different at night, finding a little Italian trattoria to sit down and have dinner. Yeah, with locals. Recommended to, with locals. Yeah. Yeah, very, very different, but, Fantastic. but, but just really, really good to see oh. it that way as well. Favourite cruise experience? So I've been, uh, I'm lucky enough to have been on a couple of, of launches. I, went, I was at the launch of Queen Mary 2 when, um, when the Queen pressed the button for the, for the champagne to hit the side. I was lucky enough to be on the launch of Britannia, also when the Queen was there again. So I've managed to see the Queen twice wow. at, at cruise launches. But I had a really nice experience that I really enjoyed. And I think it shows the amount of detail that cruise companies go into these days when it comes to the kind of things that they try and put on for guests. And it was the naming of Carnival Splendour. It's a few years ago now, uh, maybe eight years ago, I think, 2008. And Mylene Class was the, was the godmother. So Mylene was on, um, we were all waiting for Mylene 
on, on deck and she's got a grand piano there and she starts singing Rod Stewart's Sailing. Beautiful voice, amazing piano player and things like that. And the next thing you know, there's a Royal Navy frogman scaling up the side of the ship with a bottle of champagne in his hand to the James Bond theme. Oh. He climbs over and then they, they break the, the champagne together. And I mean, it not only shows the level of detail, but I was talking to, I was lucky enough to be sat for dinner that night with the Royal Navy team who were there. And there were two of them who, who'd been the guys who'd been, because they have to go down together. They'd actually been sat on the bottom of the seabed waiting for the signal to come up. And they'd been down there for about something like 45 minutes. And I said, well, what were you doing? They said, well, we were just sat there, pretty much like you and I are now, on the seabed. And in my mind, I just had this vision of them having some like waterproof <laughs> playing cards or something. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Passing the time away. Oh, texting yeah, them. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what they were up to, but they were down there for about 45 minutes. And suddenly the call came, he said, and then I knew that it was me that had to go up. But it was just a f really fascinating and fun experience. And like I said, it just shows the amount of detail that these companies go into yes. when it comes to providing something different for people who are on board. Yeah. Obviously, with your launches and with cruising, you've eaten, you must have eaten in some lovely restaurants. Marco Pierre White, you mentioned earlier. Mm. Any others that are notable? Well, I, I do actually think Marco Pierre White's my favourite, just because he is such an amazing, amazing chef. Mm. I met him at the, at the Britannia launch, and he's he's just got this rock and roll persona about him. He was signing some books <laughs> and things like that, and he really was just sort of like a geezer, if I, if, <laughs> if, if I, if I can say that. You know, he puts his arm around you, gives you a big cuddle, yeah. just a really nice guy. And of course, his food's absolutely amazing as well. Yeah. Who could not like? Yeah, Something it's great. And, and what's wonderful is you pay really a relatively tiny supplement um, to, to eat there. Um, for, you know, if you're going to, I mean, it's, it's fiver or a tenner or less. Some ships don't have that. I mm. mean, Nobu is on crystal and there's no supplement at all. So you're getting a fine dining experience, you know, whilst you're on board for such small amount of money. Absolutely. And, and I think that's another great thing about cruising is that if you do like your food, it is the place to be, isn't yes. it? I mean, you know, the signature restaurants are, in, are incredible, mm. but the buffets offer a really good uh, yeah, standard basic offering that you can just go if you're looking for something yeah. quick and nice and easy and there's always somewhere yeah. to grab a bite if, Definitely. You, if you want. And with little girls, with your twins, you know, really useful for the buffet because then they can just cherry pick absolutely oh, it's what great. they want. We, we love a kid's tea. Yeah. As soon as we see kid's tea on the, uh, on, on the restaurant menus, that, yes. that's it, yes. Get them in early, five, six o'clock, so they're fed, ready for bed. Yeah, that's well at 25, really my daughter loved jelly. And so when she saw jelly was on the menu every day, it was like, that's it. There you go. Um, destinations for you, James, any particular ones that spring to mind that you've really loved? So Piraeus in Athens is is really close to my heart. I think largely because of my history growing up in Greece and that feeling of just that sense of adventure because there's so many different boats that leave Piraeus Harbour. So obviously the cruise ships, then you get the inter-island ferries, then you get the flying dolphins that go to the closer islands and it's just this hive of activity and it feels like a hive of hope and expectation of people are going on holiday in some way, shape or form, whatever that may be, whether they're zipping over to an island for a weekend yeah. or they've just come in on a 4,000 seat uh, berth cruise ship. There's this sense of expectation about being in Piraeus. It's just such a wonderful, vibrant place to be. Like all ports, it's a bit rough around the edges and a bit scruffy and stuff, but I think that all adds to the charm. And then my other favorite one, I think is Istanbul. Again, oh. that link uh, because it, Istanbul is a city's Greek roots and the fact that it's at the crossroads of of two continents, uh, Europe on one side and then Asia on the other, and all these iconic sites that you can mm. see when you sail up the Bosphorus, you know, you see Hagia Sophia and the, the Blue Mosque and all yes. that kind of stuff. And it's just it's just the most evocative city, I think, it to, is. to sail Even from. Even just to wander around and, and, and spend quite a lot of time in the souk. Oh, yes. <laughs> you wouldn't be shopping by any chance, would you? Oh, yeah. I did see the sights as well, but yeah, it is, yeah. it's extraordinary, It, it, it really it? is. And again, it has that same feeling. I think all the best ports have that. Obviously, they're fantastic little more boutique style place yeah. that you can pull into. But I think pulling into one of these world-renowned ports, New York, Istanbul, Piraeus, where there's just this sense of something big is happening and it's to do with man's life on land and his want to explore the oceans. I just think that's fascinating. 
anything on on your cruise wish list? Um, I've never sailed into New York, and I think that would be one of my favourites. Yeah. I've done things like the Staten Island Ferry and things like that, and I think seeing some of New York as you arrive, obviously they've moved the cruise terminal now across the across yeah. the river, but I still think you'd get that sense of the new of the Manhattan skyline as you're arriving. Yeah. I think just generally a transatlantic yeah. would be. I'm not sure how how well I do be on a ship for five whole days without touching foot <laughs> on land at all. But uh, yeah, I think a transatlantic journey in the, in the good old sense of our forebears who went over there hundreds of years ago, I think that'd be fascinating to do. Oh. Final question. You've, you've been a blogger, you've visited all the countries, you've, you've, you know, an amazing travel writer. Any tips for any aspiring travel writers that may be watching today? Don't do it. Oh, you're joking. <laughs> well, look, it gives you... Look at the life you've had. I know. It gives you a fantastic, fantastic way of seeing the world relatively cheaply. The one thing that I would say is that it's the kind of job now that almost every writer wants to get into. So you aren't going to make millions if you get into travel writing. There's no doubt about it. However, you will have experiences that will be beyond what money can buy. It, it really is the most incredible lifestyle. I think one thing that I would say is for anybody who wants to do it is not only get out there and travel, but give yourself up, give some time up to a newspaper desk or a magazine desk or a radio station or a TV station and offer your services. Do work experience. If they ask you, don't think about going home at five o'clock or doing a nine to five okay. job or something like that, because that's not what journalism is about. Journalism is about working 24 hours a day, if yep. need be. Yep. And be the first person to get into the office, be the last person to get out, make yourself available and you will get noticed. And it's the people who get noticed who end up staying. And I've seen that time and time again when it comes to working in newspapers. And I've seen people go from being work experienced people to being heads of departments, features editors, and of course, travel writers. So Fantastic. It, I think it really is just a case of applying yourself and making sure you don't give up. And don't miss your opportunities like you knocking on the door and saying, can I have the travel editor's Stick job? Stick your hand up for Training everything. everything. It used everything. to amaze me when I used to work at Metro and people would come in and be working on work experience. And I'd say, does anybody fancy a trip? I've got a last minute invite to go to so-and-so and I can't make it. And some people wouldn't put their hands up. Mad. Yeah, and if I if I rewound ten or fifteen years earlier to when I was starting my career, I would have been the first person saying, "Yeah, I'll go away." Yeah. Yeah. So thank just, you. Just do it. Thank you, James. I've loved talking to you. Thanks so much for joining You're me. You're welcome. Thank Thanks you. For me. And thank you to you for watching. I'll see you next time with another edition of the Blogger's Guide to Cruising. Bye for now, though. Mm -hmm.